Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Pragmatic Investor. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking to fellow essay contributor, Victor Durganov. Victor has been writing on Seeking Alpha since 2017, has amassed 40,000 followers, and is the author of the Financial Profit Investing Group. Victor considers himself a diversified investor, investing in anything from tech stocks to commodities to even crypto. So we really had a lot to talk about today. We covered everything from the upcoming tech earnings to the future of Bitcoin and even the macro situation. I really enjoyed this conversation with Victor. As always, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. All right, welcome again to The Pragmatic Investor. I'm joined today by fellow essay contributor, Victor Durganov. Thanks for coming, Victor. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very glad to be here. All right, well, getting started, I think the question on everyone's mind is, that's a very interesting name, Victor Durganov. Ah, okay. Uh, so yeah, I... I uh, I chose to go with my actual name instead of uh, instead of going with like a pseudonym or something, you know. Like, uh, um, yeah, just uh, that's just my name, Victor Durganov. It is what it is. Uh, I was born in um, in Odessa, Ukraine. It's uh, Odessa, Ukraine now, but it was actually the Soviet Union back then. And my family uh, immigrated to the U to to the United States when I was very young, when it was still the Soviet Union. So uh, I actually spent most of my time living in uh, in Connecticut of all places uh that's where i got my education and my financial background and my uh, investment experience and all that and um and then i actually i um i did a bit of traveling in in my in my 30s and um and i actually i uh, i met my uh, my wife in uh, in ukraine of all places because <laughs> it is a uh, um, my home city is Odessa, and I do it, it. It is a very lovely place. It's very nice. Unfortunately, we have the uh, the situation, the war going on. Um, but uh, I met my wife, my my wonderful wife there, and we had some children. Um, we we actually had the we actually had twins, and they were only uh, five. Uh, I think they were or six six weeks old when the uh, when the, the Russian invasion started. So uh, a week after the invasion, we uh, we just picked everything up. Uh, well, everything we could. Um, the kids uh, first, and you know some uh, just some things in the SUV, and we and we left uh, we left Ukraine, and uh, we went. Uh, we had a little a little, um, I guess it was a little journey through Europe. But uh, we've been in Greece now for for about a year. So we are we are living here in uh, in, in beautiful Greece. Uh, very nice, right? Uh, right next to the sea. <laughs> so enjoying the Mediterranean, I'm enjoying, are you? <laughs> I'm enjoying my time. My time here, yes. It's it's the Mediterranean. I believe it's the uh, the the Aegean part of the uh, Aegean Sea, part of the Mediterranean. Oh, right. Yeah, well, a very unfortunate situation, of course. Ukraine, of course, living here in uh, Spain, we did get you know a lot of uh, a lot of refugees. I know a few people personally who took took a lot of people in, and fortunately, I think. You know those people are right, but obviously the situation is still unfolding. Um, let's get into investing. Tell us all a bit more about uh, your investing background. So, what did you? Um, how did you get into finance and investing? And then how did you get into seeking alpha? Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, I guess it's another interesting story because uh, I was very young. I was only about uh, I, think I was I was only like sixteen, and um, for some reason I just found uh investing interesting i don't know it was my uncle he uh he got me into it he 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 started talking about the wall street journal and how i should be reading it when i was 16 and um how there's like these things called stocks and they're parts of companies and you can own them and you can buy them and you can get rich so um i got pretty interested in that and i started looking at you know at all the quotes in the wall street journal and i had no idea what what any of it meant so it took me a while you know i uh, obviously i had my uncle he was an experienced um uh he was a trader on the um, on the nymex on the new york mercantile exchange so he was a, a successful trader there and um he began um 
I guess, uh, tutoring me, just uh, telling me about uh, about the basics and then about some more advanced strategies. And then, um, you know, we put some money to work uh, early. I was uh, only, I believe I was only 20 when I made my first, my first um, investment. Uh, it was some, um, it was in Coca-Cola, yeah, Coke. And it kind of just went on, went, went on from there. It's, uh, you know, uh, I just started, uh, started investing, just buying stock little by little, little by little, then started trading a little bit. And then, uh, simultaneously I got my financial, uh, um, I got my, uh, my, my financial knowledge also from the university degrees that I got. I have, um, a bachelor's degree from, uh, Colorado State University in management. And I also have a, a master's degree and MBA from, uh, from Washington State University. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, all of that together with the, with my experience in investing and my, um, and, and, uh, you know, my, uh, my schooling, I guess you can call it that, uh, uh, that just, uh, naturally brought me onto seeking alpha. And I started reading articles on there as part of just, the, you know, just a strategy to, uh, to find out information on stocks. And I remember reading these Herbalife, uh, articles a long time ago. It was maybe like 15 years ago or something when, there, when, when, uh, <clears throat> when Herbalife was in the, was in the spotlight and um bill ackman was shorting it and it was just like a whole huge debate about herbal life back then and i was i remember reading those articles and i thought hey maybe uh maybe i should write something here on seeking alpha <laughs> so, so um in 2017 um well actually before then i attempted i attempted a few uh i think it was two or three um herbal life articles and they got rejected so i kind of gave up on seeking alpha for a while <laughs> But then, but then in 2017, I, um, I decided to write, to write an article about, um, just about, uh, about the, the macroeconomic situation that was going on. It was when Donald Trump, I believe, uh, like first became president. It was around that time. So, um, so I wrote the, I, I wrote this article and, um, it was, it was basically just about, uh, the current, the current, uh, economic state of things and um and it got some good reviews and uh, and the people from seeking alpha are like wow we like it so um you know <laughs> we want some more articles from you we're, we're waiting for the next one so then i wrote something about gold about gold miners and that actually went on went on it became like uh, i guess a hit a hit piece it was uh, not a hit piece but it was a popular article is what i mean it was on the, on, on the trending uh section and it got quite a bit it got it got quite a few views i think it got you know 10 or twenty thousand views or page views or something like that and back then i thought that was a lot so i thought that was really cool so um i just uh, i just continued to write and then seeking alpha approached me with uh uh with an idea for a marketplace for a marketplace service and um i liked the idea right away i thought it was uh, i thought it was a good uh, good long-term investment and um it turned out to be that way so yeah. i've been with uh yeah i've been i've been partnered with seeking alpha for um for i think uh, i think almost six years now so it's been a it's, it's, it's been a great ride I, I love the people there uh great support great uh very professional just uh just the best uh the best people to work with and they've been uh they've been extremely helpful uh throughout this um um, you know, the, the situation with you, with the, with the war and everything, because, uh, you know, they've been very supportive, especially, uh, especially Mike Hopkins and, uh, and, uh, Tim from, uh, from, from, from marketplace and several, several other guys, they've been, uh, they've been a real help to, to us. Very grateful to them. Yeah. Well, obviously so, I got to agree with you there. Obviously a lot of the good people working at Seeking Alpha. I will say I would like to congratulate you because you've done quite well, I believe. I mean, at least uh, from my point of view on Seeking Alpha, you've amassed uh, around 40,000 followers, I believe. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Yes, I believe it's, it's close to 42,000 and my goal is to hit 50 by the end of the year, 50,000 followers. And, uh, 
you know, if anyone told me that I would have 50,000 50, followers five years ago when I first started writing uh, on Seeking Alpha, I would probably say you're crazy. But uh, nevertheless, uh, here we are because back then I was, uh, I had like no followers and I would look at people who have five or 6,000 and I would say, wow, they have uh, these guys, they have a lot of followers. <laughs> and now, uh, yeah, like you said, I have uh, around 40,000. Awesome. So. And then you have your marketplace of financial profit. Now, I, I wanted to know in terms of investing, because I have read a lot of your pieces, obviously, you, you're often uh, taking up space there on the trending. So I often yes. encounter your pieces there. And you do write about quite a varied, uh, varied topics. Just in general, yes. what would you consider to be your investment uh, ethos, your, your style? Yeah. So um, I think the most important thing is to be uh diversified uh well diversified mm -hmm. and um also uh you want to rotate uh you want to rotate at the at the right times because the market is continually rotating from one sector to the next and you want to you want to go with the market you don't want to you never want to go against the market obviously you want to go with the wave so um diversification rotation uh, i also like to to trade trade a little bit around the peaks and troughs uh, this is done mostly during volatile periods when the markets are calmer um, there's far less uh, rebalancing and uh, trading involved uh, also i use this, this strategy this uh, covered call strategy to mm -hmm. increase uh, increase yield and improve uh, portfolio uh performance aside from that i think it just comes down to picking uh picking really good uh companies that you believe in you, that you you know you have conviction in, and you understand uh the bit the business more or less because investing in something that you, that you have no idea what they do is probably not not the best idea in the world mm -hmm. so i mean that's just that's just several things that are I guess, uh, how did you call it? The, the investment ethos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, okay, so a diversified approach. I do, um, I've been personally looking at a uh, different option strategy. I do quite like that idea of the covered calls. Um, also, also the collar play we, we use quite often during, uh, you know, when it gets really volatile, we lay mm -hmm. our put on top of the, uh, on top of the uh, covered call and we turn that, you know, turn them into a collar play and that's uh that's that's really worked out well during you know in in, in last year <laughs> it okay. was working well you can explain for the listeners uh how exactly the a collar play would work then or maybe a quick example yeah. of it sure absolutely so um let's uh let's say you have a company any company um better to have a company that's uh that's that's uh, that's higher alpha something like you know, like an AMD or an NVIDIA or NVIDIA or a Tesla. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, you have a um, you have a company uh, reporting. Say, say Tesla is going to report. Uh, in, in actually, Tesla just uh, just reported. Just reported, recently. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's take a different company. It doesn't really matter which company. Company XYZ that's going to report in, in a in a week or so. And we want to protect our our investment, correct? So, what we would do is we would sell uh we would sell a covered call option and mm -hmm. then we would take that premium say we would we would get i usually like to go for you know four to six weeks out for the uh for the, the expiration date and i usually go for the strike that's uh slightly slightly out of the money so say we get about five or six percent for our premium for our covered call uh i I would then take, you know, either that whole premium or part of it and uh, buy put options with it uh, mm -hmm. to further protect our position. And that's basically, that's the collar play right there. That I mean, it's, it sounds, some people say, oh, a collar play, it sounds uh, difficult or, or <laughs> it sounds complicated, but it's really not. You're just selling, you're just selling covered calls and then you're just buying puts with the, uh, you know, with the premium. That's basically it. Okay. So, uh, after, you know, after you buy the puts, uh, say the earnings come out, uh, they're not so good. The stock, you know, drops by 10%. If, if you have the right puts on, you know, you could get, uh, you could get a, a threefold, a fourfold, or a fivefold, uh, on those, on those puts in a, you know, mm -hmm. 
in 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 a few days you know if the stock falls by 10 or 20 percent so mm-hmm. those puts can appreciate quite quickly of course but of course if the opposite happens and then the price goes up then you would of course be forced yes. to uh, sell your position right or Calls. Yes, if if the price goes up, then you know, then you're going to lose. Uh, you're not losing anything uh, because because you're using uh, because to buy the puts you're using uh, the money from the premium. So you're not actually losing right. any money, but then you're losing upside potential on the stock. Yes, mm-hmm. that's true. Right. Uh, I noticed a lot of the company just mentioned uh, Nvidia, AMD, uh, Tesla. All of these course uh some of the big tech names and of course very relevant now because we are pretty much into that uh tech uh, well e- earnings season i think it's uh as we're recording this microsoft and google will be reporting today tuesday after the close if i'm not mistaken i believe you're right yes yep and of course we got tesla uh last week so just would love to know your thoughts on maybe the upcoming earnings season um any particular ideas or positioning behind behind the current earnings yes uh, so you know i i like to start by look by looking at the banks of course because they're usually the the first big companies to report and um uh, you know often to, uh, a lot of the times if if the bank earnings are good the uh, most other earnings are good too if the banks if the bank earnings are bad we're there's a good chance we're gonna have a bad earnings season now, uh, so far, despite some challenge, challenges in the, in the banking sector, we've, you know, we've had the, the Silicon Valley Bank go under, and, you know, there's some concerns about Charles Schwab now, not going under, just the uh, concerns about, you know, the losses in their, in, um, in their bond portfolios, mm-hmm. they call it, I believe. Mm-hmm. Basically, I think they have a lot of derivatives on, on their books that are worth a lot less than they claim and it's not just charles schwab it's uh, it's many banks it's similar to what happened in 2008 but it's i don't think it's anywhere near that magnitude um just because of the regulation that's been that's been put in place but uh, the greed is no is is no less of course um but i don't think we're in the same situation that we were in 2008 or even a similar one so i don't expect uh, like um, big bank failures or anything like that uh, but, um, we are seeing some issues and, um, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, so far the banks, uh, JP Morgan actually had great results and, you know, the stock, the stock flew other banks provided other big banks like Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, Citibank provided pretty good results. Um, so I, uh, I don't see any, anything that, um, you know that troubling regarding this earning season uh yes we're, we're, we're gonna have a little dip in uh in eps year over year and then you know some companies are gonna have revenue declines year over year but that's normal to slow down so this is to be expected uh, i don't think we're gonna have a terrible earning season as far as tech goes so uh we saw tesla report tesla stock sold off but the earnings they weren't they really weren't that bad it was just a, a slight, uh, slight miss on revenues, and that's that was uh, primarily because of the price cuts. So, I suspect we're going to have a decent earnings season. And but the thing is, uh, stocks are in a um, in a tough spot here because even the decent earning, even if you want to call. Uh, you know the these earnings decent and i guess they are given the the whole macro situation um um still um there's a lot of uncertainty ahead so i'm a little concerned what's going to happen after earnings because i'm focusing on economic data and a lot of data has been has been worsening Mm -hmm. like uh yes like it's good that inflation is coming down but you know there's a lot of uh housing data and there's there's a lot of uh there's a lot of troubling um consumer related data mm-hmm. and um yeah and the economy is mostly consumer based um, i'm sure you know it's like 70 in the us it's like 70% consumer based economy so uh if the consumer starts to you know consumer sentiment if it, if it continues to uh, 
to sour. And if, uh, if the labor market worsens, so if we get that, if we get that double whammy of, uh, uh, you know, the, the relatively high inflation, um, along with, uh, you know, uh, the consumer feeling the pinch from the, from the higher, from the higher interest rates, hi- higher borrowing costs, um, you know, we're probably going to see quite a bit of slowdown and we're probably going to see the labor market worsening in the, in the coming, in the coming months. So I don't really, I don't really consider these earnings that important right now, just because there, there's so many critical factors after that, that are, that are going to influence, you know, stock prices more than, than these earnings uh, probably would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that seems to be a bit of a consensus at some point. I mean, uh, in general, analysts have been talking about this recession for quite a lot of time. It hasn't quite materialized, but as you say, you know, we're, we're starting to get that evidence. So I think now, I think I was reading today some analysts by uh, Wedbush, I think, um, talking about the idea that the earnings today might, or the earnings that come out this week won't be so bad. But of course, looking perhaps at that forward guidance, um, that's yes. when, you know, companies are going to start saying, well, you know, watch out because in the next, six 12 months three four quarters you know things are going to slow down substantially yes yes forward, forward guidance is certainly the uh, the thing to watch during you know during any earning season but this earning season especially and i also want to just uh, just add that um i believe uh, the if if we um if we take away the the uh, the part of the I guess the part of the economy that the government uh, supports, you know, let's mm-hmm. call it the government side of the economy. If we, if, if we separate that from the, from the actual, like, you know, commercial business side of the economy, I believe the business commercial side of the economy mm, has already been with, is, is already in a recession. Mm-hmm. It's um, the numbers don't, don't scream recession or haven't screamed recession only because the government side of the economy, I guess the government has been propping up uh, the economy, basically. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how long um, the government can continue to do this. So um, we're probably going to be in an official recession uh, this uh, the, this year. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the the, the the question is how de- how deep is it going to be? Because a sh- a relatively shallow recession is not it's not gonna it shouldn't hurt stock prices too much, and maybe you know we might have seen the bottom of thirty five hundred SPX, or we may see it a little bit lower at thirty two hundred, you know possibly three thousand. But if um, if the recession gets deep, then all bets are off, <laughs> and only time will tell how uh, how low stocks will go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This also at a time where, you know, I believe you're probably already aware of this, but over the last uh, few months, especially tech stocks really have been carrying the most of the uh, most of the indexes higher, right? So if you actually look absolutely. at um, of how they're priced, you know, in terms of a forward PE, they're getting the valuations are getting very rich right now, and as as you say, there might not be a, a good reason to justify that moving forward. Yes, uh, yes, that's. Uh, uh, that's very well said, and, and and what I can add to that is that is that yes, some companies like Nvidia and AMD and several so several others have really um, just have had massive rebounds of one hundred percent or more since since their bottoms and their valuations. Like you said, they're they're getting they're getting pretty high again. However, um, we're looking at at at, at almost like a almost like 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 two different economies because if we look at a company like google for instance uh google is very cheap right now it's only trading at like 16 times full forward uh forward earnings mm-hmm. um, um my opinion i mean i believe it's because uh it's because um future earnings are, are uncertain in companies like google because there's a lot of ads ads uh, there's a lot of uh you know, ad spending going on and, and things of that nature. So, um, <clears throat> so investors are are I guess they're skeptical about about bidding these uh, these kind of these kinds of stocks up uh, these kinds of stocks up too high. But uh, 
and NVIDIA and AMD, they're getting most of the, uh, and, you know, other semiconductor and, of course, stocks like Tesla, too. And just many different stocks are getting getting lots of bids and and, and they're they're getting too uh too expensive now yes i i definitely agree with you but there's also i i also want to want to emphasize that that there are still uh there's there are a lot of uh, quality companies that are not expensive right now so it's it's a it's it's a strange market we're we're observing here mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree with you on, uh, on both of those points, the idea that a yes we are heading into a recession, but also that you know perhaps some of these companies uh, do offer a significant value. I mean, you did you recently had that call out on Tesla, which is still rating as a buy. Uh, you mentioned Google as well is uh, sure. probably a probably a decent a decent buy at these levels. Would I be correct I then in saying buy. that your overall assessment is that you know if if we do get a bit of a sell off. You're looking basically at building positions, you know, if if it goes down from here, sort of playing it more into the long term. Yes, 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 absolutely. I, I want to throw Amazon into that mix because that's one of my favorite companies. I also want to want to want to want to give a shout out to Palantir. Uh, that company gets a lot of hate, and that company is is cheap, and that company, in my view, is going to be worth a lot of money one day. That is an underrated company. Mm -hmm. That is a company that's just filled with uh, with the best talent that, um, that there is in the world, in my view. And they're doing things that are amazing. And they are, and there's essentially no competition. So, I mean, that's a company that I want to own. That's my biggest position in my portfolio is Palantir. That's a company that I want to own for the long term. I don't care if it goes down to $5 because I'll buy more than $5. Um, Similar story with Tesla. I mean, I've owned Tesla since 2013. Um, that's been one of my one of my best uh, best investments over the years. Of course, I've I've uh, I've adjusted the position, you know, many times. In, in, I mean, it's been ten years, uh, but I've been long throughout most of the most of the time. Um, I'm long Tesla now, and uh, you know, if I get the opportunity to buy it at 150 or lower. I'll buy more at 150 or lower because I believe in these companies long term. I think that they're going a lot higher. Same thing with Google. I think it's a great buy here. If it goes uh, below 100 again, 90, 95, excellent. I, I, will, I would love to buy more. Amazon, same thing. And we can go down the list. There, there are many uh, great uh, semiconductor companies. Um, NVIDIA is expensive, but it, if, if it ever goes back to $100 again, <laughs> I'll, I'll back up the truck and um amd same thing if i ever see that anywhere near 50 or 60 i'm backing up the truck there as well of course so i don't think we're going to see those prices again i don't think we're seeing nvidia at 100 or tesla at 100 i think those are behind us i think those were bear market market bottoms and i know that it's i know that during a bear market phase it's uh you know people some people like to be overly or maybe they don't like to be but they just are overly um bearish i guess um and i've lived through a couple of bear markets so i've i've seen this i'm not saying that we've seen that we've seen the bottom we've seen the worst but i uh, i think that future sell-offs will bring uh, buying opportunities i don't think the world is going to end any i mean i hope <laughs> it's not going to end anytime soon and um also i don't think that um uh that good companies are going to stay down for a prolonged prolonged period of time like just take a look uh in retrospect what happened to nvidia 100 to 120 was the buy zone that i was recommending it went into that level and then it just exploded higher same thing with tesla around the same area i was recommending 100 it hit i think it hit exactly 100 or whatever like around 105 maybe and it's you know it like doubled since then of course, it's been volatile, and we're going to see volatility persist. But my point is that you you see a great company that's down. That means that there's blood in the streets, and it's it's probably time to buy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take you back on something you just said that, uh, of course, a lot of people might uh, consider a little bit controversial, which is that assessment that a uh, Palantir is cheap. Now, I've yes, written about okay. Palantir before, also, um, you know, kind of 
switching a little bit from kind of more bullish to a bit less bullish, but generally also kind of appreciating that the company has something special. But you know, what would you say to those to those naysayers who talk about obviously the uh, the uh, lack of um, the lack of profitability and of course that big issue, which is the uh, the stock based compensation? Or just why why would you say what metrics would yeah. make you say it's cheap? How yeah. is it cheap? Sure. To you? Okay, those the, those are great questions. So let let, let me address those be, before I get to to mm-hmm. my point why I think it's cheap. So uh, about the stock uh, the stock based uh, compensation. So um, lately, I mean, I I don't know about uh, prob- I I don't think that most people go through like the ten you know like uh, like the financial reports uh, like you know like like I do mm-hmm. uh, as uh, probably. Um, as closely and <laughs> i'm not saying that that no one does this. i'm just saying that no normal people probably don't do this <laughs> okay so i'll just tell you what, what i see when i want to look at palantir and and i've looked at their at their uh, reports and their books and their quarterlies and quarterly reports very very carefully uh so um there there were concerns about about dilution and uh just about any company that goes, you know, that initially goes public, there's some dilution. Um, Palantir shares got, you know, got diluted at first when, when the company went to uh, initially IPO'd. Uh, there was uh, arguably some excessive uh, stock-based compensation, um, you know, when the company first first went public. However, um, it's been it's been around two years since since Palantir went public, so. Uh, if if you look at it now, so uh, the the stock based compensation it's 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 much less um, relative to uh, to what it was before, and 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 there is minimal uh, dilution, um, you know, in 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 in, in recent quarters. Um, now, as the company's revenues continue to increase and increase and increase. Um, that stock-based compensation, you know, in, in, in percentages will matter less, less and less. So, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not concerned about the, the, the SPC at all here. Um, and, and what was the other one about the, um, you had the question about the SBC and the, and the lack of the, pro- and the lack of profit, mm-hmm. profitability. Actually, you know, uh, Palantir just uh, last quarter was a it was a gap it was a gap profitable quarter right not mm-hmm. you know n- n- not a non gap prof- gap mm-hmm. profitable quarter so I mean that's a big deal so I mean that right there illustrates that the company um you know I, I mean it can it can certainly be profitable because <laughs> right there, I mean, it was only a cent. It was only one cent in EPS, but it's, it's a gap profit nevertheless. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, obviously, obviously the company uh, can, uh, can be profitable. Now, uh, why I say it's cheap. I say, I say it's cheap because uh, the revenues, they keep on growing. And um, the, um, the the market cap it's not increasing anymore because you know the, the stock price it's not going up nor nor is there a dilution going up. so the market cap I think is somewhere around like seventeen billion maybe sixteen seventeen billion now and um, mm-hmm. so Palantir is trading at like maybe six or seven times forward uh, six or seven times forward uh, forward sales. Mm-hmm. Um, while that may sound like, I guess, like it's not cheap, there's there are not many companies in Palantir's position that have such a long, um, such a long growth runway. Mm-hmm. So Palantir can probably continue to to grow revenues at double digits for many years. So um, mm-hmm. um, possibly, you know, possibly a, a decade, a decade or longer, we could see. We can see Palantir. You know, obviously, its growth it's gonna it's gonna slow down. From, it's it's slowed down from thirty percent to around twenty five percent. We're gonna see twenty percent. You know, we but but we could see it. You know, um, be around twenty twenty two percent for uh, you know through maybe twenty twenty six twenty twenty seven and then drop into the teens after that. 
So um, right now at, at six or seven times sales, Palantir is, uh, in my eyes, it's relatively cheap. In my mind, it's relatively cheap to its uh, forward uh you know, growth and of course, profitability prospects, because as the company continues to generate more and more revenue growth, uh, it's going to become more and more and more profitable. Uh, Palantir is one of the most profitable companies. It has remarkable margins. It has an, an 80% gross margin, 80%. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, that's staggering. So, I mean, uh, I think this time, I think this company just, just needs a little bit more time and just a little bit more patience from investors and they'll understand. And when, when many investors under most, many or most investors on the sudden they jump on the train, I mean, you're going to see the stock at like 20, 25, $30, I think within the next maybe one or two years. I don't think, I, I don't think that's such a, uh, such a high target for this, uh, for the stock. Well, I have to say you make a very compelling point. I might have to uh, go and look at th- those financial reports and maybe uh, consider oh consider the position <laughs> or you can just read my articles because i point out all the uh, so you don't have to, i do all the hard work for you <laughs> exactly absolutely um, so you don't have to sift through everything <laughs> we've talked a lot in this example about fundamentals like or stock fundamentals like the price to sales and um obviously these uh metrics which do move uh stock price a lot but another uh kind of metric Factors that affect markets a lot and stocks, obviously, are macro factors, right? So we've already talked about the possibility of recession. I think also um, liquidity has been talked a lot about. I think especially towards the beginning of the year, um, we got that obviously that big, uh, big kind of rally in the Nasdaq and some of the risk assets, Bitcoin and uh, those which we'd love to get into later. And a lot of that, people were talking about kind of that increase in uh, in global liquidity maybe that liquidity coming from from China and uh, certain other metrics how do you personally uh, fit in the macro with maybe the more fundamental analysis is that something that you that you weigh in on a regular basis how do you uh, how does that fit into your own analysis yes of course on a regular basis i always look at that and here we have, we have to we have to look i mean it's all about the fed and um and the um and the data so it's all about it's, it's all about the fed and the and the economic indicators mm-hmm. so um we have, i mean we we have high interest rates there's no i mean for for the united states they're high and you know for 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 this time right now obviously they they were higher you know in the past but we're not in the past so in our current situation, we have unsustainably high interest rates in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not going to talk globally because I don't feel that I'm that I'm that big of a specialist on on, on, on certain markets, even maybe European ones. But I know I'm um, I know the U.S. economy pretty well. I think, um, and the interest the the rate the rate the rates are very high. Um, so we're going to, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trouble with the consumer, of course, because of borrowing costs. Uh, the consumer can't, can borrow as much as, as the consumer wants. So obviously the consumer can't spend as much as the consumer wants to spend. And that's, that's going to translate into, you know, worsening, uh, worsening revenues and profits for, uh, for corporations. And also corporations are, are facing, you know, higher borrowing costs themselves. And that is, that is another, uh, that is another problem, higher refinancing costs. So there are, there are many, uh, uh, consequences from, from, uh, this, this current Fed policy. I understand that inflation needed to be brought down, but it probably, uh, should have been, you know, checked ahead of time. It, it should have never been allowed to, to get that high. And the Fed allowed it to get that high. And now the Fed, it's doing a relatively uh, good job of bringing it down. Nevertheless, um, it is hurting the economy. Mm-hmm. So um, I, see, I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of potential uh, for stocks and for the economy when the Fed uh, pivots. And I think the pivot and I think the pivot is going to come soon. Mm-hmm. I, 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 
Uh, I think it's going to take uh, probably another another good stock market sell off for um, for the Fed to really um, suggest make a make a firm suggestion that that a pivot is coming that uh, uh, you know a shift in monetary mm-hmm. uh, policy is close that rates aren't only going to be you know uh, forget about raising rates. They're, they're, they're not just going to be, you know, steady, but the Fed is going to hint at, at probably lowering rates soon and possibly even, even more QE. There, there's, there's mm-hmm. going to be more QE, believe me. There's going to be more QE. That mm-hmm. balance sheet is never, is, I mean, that money is never coming off. It's never mm-hmm. coming off that balance sheet. All that money, never. I mean, maybe a little bit. <laughs> like we had, we had about a trillion come off. But then, you know, we had like, we had like, uh, like five more <laughs> put on. So it's like, it's like the Fed uh, takes uh, uh, one step forward and five steps back in, in terms of, of reducing its balance sheet. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm not in the camp that believes that that balance sheet is ever getting reduced. I'm in the camp, you know, I believe it's going to keep, keep going up. I believe inflation, you know, it's, there's nothing transitory about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, it's, 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 it's being, you know, it's, it's, uh, come down a bit, but still the CPI, it's at around 5%. That's high, you know, given, given the target rate of 2%, 5% is very high. Um, so yeah, the fed is going to have a, a really, uh, a really challenging time, um, getting back to that 2% target rate. And I actually believe that, mm-hmm. that the fed will eventually, uh, raise its uh, its target rate from two percent, its inflation target rate from two percent to a target rate of you know three percent or higher, maybe three to four percent would be a more uh, a more realistic uh, rate of inflation for for the future, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You touch on a lot of uh, good points there, and I find myself agreeing with all of what you say, especially that idea that obviously. The way the financial system now is just so dependent on that increasing uh, presence of the the monetary policy and the uh, the uh, asset purchases by the Fed, it's definitely going to be very hard, if not impossible, to wind that down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's just so dependent. Mm-hmm. So yeah, dependent I, on it, absolutely. And you kind of already moved into what was going to be my next question, which was going to be your take, of course, on inflation, which you've already touched a little bit about. And then perhaps we could look a little bit, uh, maybe you could give us uh, some of your insights into maybe commodities or maybe some of those plays that since you do believe in that maybe permanently high rate of inflation, how do you uh, expect to protect your portfolio going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I am, of course, I'm big in in materials Mm -hmm. and uh, industrials I like Uh, right now. Right now, I have uh, about actually about twenty five percent of my portfolio in in gold and silver related assets. Mm-hmm. About uh, about five percent uh, or six percent uh, is is in physical metals, and then uh, and then the rest is in you know around eighteen percent or so is in is in gold and silver gold and silver related um, equities, miners mostly. Mm-hmm. So I am very bullish on 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 gold and silver as uh, as we advance from here. Uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'm also bullish on, on 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 other commodities like oil and copper. But uh, if the recession in, intensifies, the, mm-hmm. uh, you know the uh, <clears throat> due to to the loss of demand, we're going to see we're going to see price drops in these uh, mm-hmm. probably more severe price drops than. Uh, you know than gold and uh, and silver because these are more cut, more of like protective uh, assets I guess you can call them almost like almost like hedges in a way uh, but the, but they are really good for for inflation and if uh, you know if you do believe that inflation uh, is here to stay and that the Fed uh, you know is only temporary temporarily uh, raising rates and it's going to return to return to uh, lowering them and if you look at the the yield curve. Uh, it's showing that you know that there's a recession coming, and that the bond market is very convinced that the Fed is gonna is gonna lower rates soon, <laughs> is gonna return to a to an easier stance, mm-hmm. and the bond the the bond market is usually uh, usually ahead of things 
when it comes to uh, when it comes to these matters. Uh, it's typically w- well ahead of the stock market, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, I think the uh, the Fed um, uh, the, uh, it's definitely a difficult situation for the Fed because they have the inflation problem on one hand, and then they also want to engineer a soft landing and um <clears throat> you know they have the economy that's uh, that's starting to show uh real signs of uh, of some uh of some real st- of some real stress and strain uh lately especially uh, if we look at the labor market this is this is like uh, this appears to be uh the fed's uh, last uh, like it's almost like its last hope it keeps pointing to the labor market and saying hey the labor market is still it's still strong look at that we're still adding jobs, and look at the unemployment rate. It's uh, three three point five percent. So, I mean, uh, h- how bad can the economy be? Well, let me tell you first. Uh, these numbers, they're they're a little bit. Uh, I don't want to say that they're, that they're they're deceptive, but in a way that they are, because uh, you need to, you need to uh, you, you need to take into account the participation rate, which is uh, which is relatively low. It's only like sixty two percent now. Uh, you, you need to take uh, um, other factors into consideration. You need to uh, to think about the uh, the quality of jobs that many people are losing, and then they have to replace them with uh, lesser paying jobs or you know less uh, less working hour jobs and things of that nature. So there's there are a lot of things underneath the labor market that, that we're just not seeing, and maybe you know m- maybe they're not talking enough about in the news. Uh, but the real unemployment rate, it's not 3.5%. It's, you know, it's probably at least double that. And, um, and, uh, once we start seeing weakness in labor market data, that's, uh, when, uh, when the stock, when the stock market will probably have another leg, leg lower. And that is when the Fed is, is finally going to start saying, Oh, Mm -hmm. look at the labor market. It's worsening. This is kind of like like the last, uh, the you know, kind of like the last the last straw we were holding. Now this now now this is falling apart, so we're gonna have to do something, and that's when the pivot comes in. In my view, that's that's how I see it playing out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if, if you look at the uh, past uh, actions of the Fed and how they've kind of uh, correlated with the market, I think that to an extent uh, that Fed pause you know, could be could be bullish for stocks as as long as you know, like you said the the employment is still holding up. Of course, eventually when that breaks, that's when, yeah, you get that kind of maybe a, that stock market tantrum and then that beginning yeah. of rate cuts, which normally, yeah, it coincides, right? The, the, the get, you get the rate cuts and the stock market's plummeting for a bit, but of course, then pretty quickly in the past, we've at least gotten quite a you know sharp uh, reaction where the market just gets rid of all that excess and then says, okay, now we're ready to go back up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I just wanted to, to make uh, to make a point on that. I think I think maybe um, because you're talking about past cycles and that, and that's good and that's that's definitely something we should look at. I also want to make a point about the Fed perhaps this time being a little bit uh, more proactive than usual. So okay. that's that's actually a positive factor. So I think they maybe um, got ahead of the you know the got ahead of the problem maybe ahead of time like <laughs> they're usually late like like mm. if you if if maybe if maybe we, we go back to the uh, to the banking crisis like the fed was very late on that i remember bank uh, ben bernanke saying you know what housing crisis when when everything you know was basically melting <laughs> around him so uh back then the fed was very late uh during the bank crisis this time i think i think they're doing a much better job and they're actually um you know they're they're being proactive but you know that doesn't that doesn't mean we're not going to have problems that just means that that they may not be um they may not resemble you know prior bear markets and it also may be maybe a little bit different uh um the way that the uh, that the rate uh, that the rate cycle goes this time too, be, because of the head being being proactive. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point that I hadn't really thought about so much. I mean, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. 
With that said, I have yes, been yes. looking, I mean, we are talking a bit about the idea that we're going to have higher than normal inflation. I've been looking, for example, if you compare that to the period we had maybe 70s to 80s, where you had actually quite a sustained uh, kind of period of inflation over like 10 years. Do you think that's something that could uh, repeat itself? And if that's the case, you know, do you think that assets such as well, if you look at the 70s, I think obviously gold and energy perform very well. Uh, value stocks actually outperformed versus more of the growth stocks, which would be a significant change of regime versus what we've seen like in recent years. Is that something that uh, you think could happen since that's kind of the environment that has, that you think we could be in with a bit of a higher inflation? Yeah, that's that's you know that's a very interesting question. Uh, I think I you know I don't think we're going to see exact like you know obviously we're probably not going to see exact you know the exact same scenario that we saw in the seventies or you know in, in the seventies and the eighties. Uh, but we we could see some you know we we probably will see some similarities and uh, one of those factors will probably be uh, elevated commodity prices for for longer in my view. That's why. I'm so keen on, uh, you know, on, on on gold and silver stocks uh, because they've been beaten down so badly. A, a lot of these, like, um, you know, I, I, I could name some names like like Kinross, KGC. Is, is it okay if I name some names? Yeah, it's fine, of, course, right? of course. Okay, yeah, like uh, you know, I like companies like uh, like like Bear uh, Bear Gold, <coughs> Dumont, like. Eh, eh, <coughs> uh, so, uh, I like I like many of these gold companies. They're mm-hmm. they're very very cheap, and the reason that uh, and the reason that they're cheap, and I mean they're cheap. They're, they're some of these are trading at, at like five or, or six p multiples, mm-hmm. and the reason why they're cheap, uh, the primary reason why is because future future estimates is because many analysts have future gold estimates um, at. You know, uh, uh, at at low prices, at lower prices than they are now, eighteen hundred or lower, mm-hmm. uh, which, in my view, is 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 not likely. Um, it is likely clear that we will see uh, that we will see gold above two thousand on a on a sustainable level. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I, I believe two thousand dollars may be. Um, like uh, gold could trade around it for a while now, but eventually it's it's it's, it's going to be the the new floor and the new normal is going to be you know gold above two thousand, so like mm-hmm. it could go to twenty two, twenty five hundred or whatever you know fairly quickly if if the market um, um, sets its mind you know on that uh, two thousand uh, dollars for gold is normal and you know it's kind of like the lo- like the low end price, so. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and I do think, and I do think we we could see uh, a long term appreciation cycle in, in gold, silver, and other commodities as well. Uh, so long as uh, we don't have uh, a deflationary, uh, recessionary environment during uh, you know <laughs> during mm-hmm. this time frame, of course. Right, but it's kind of like you're saying the Fed can be so proactive this time, then maybe. The idea is that they can avoid that deflation, though, if they're just quick enough, maybe, and fast enough. Yeah, is that, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm, I know hope is not a strategy, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. I, I am very hope, very <laughs> hopeful that they that the Fed uh, will be uh, wise, wise enough uh, to uh, to avoid uh, uh, deflation because that that will be. That's the worst thing that that you know that, that they could do is go from uh, from inflation mm. to deflation because that would just uh, that would be horrible for stocks. <laughs> so let's hope that uh, yeah they bring they bring the they bring inflation down uh, as much as they can, but let's uh, hope they don't overshoot uh, and you know uh, have it go negative into deflation because that would definitely be uh, something that markets would not like. <laughs> right so we've talked about commodities obviously quite bullish on gold and silver Absolutely. and of course i have to ask what are your thoughts on bitcoin oh of course bitcoin yes uh i'm a long long-term bull on bitcoin mm-hmm. uh, i'm i am uh i've been long-term bullish i continue to be long-term bullish um so uh if we consider where bitcoin is now 
it's it, it it had quite a run. So let's just let's just uh, talk about uh, uh, from the recent bottom. Uh, I believe it bottomed at around fourteen and a half thousand uh, dollars about five months ago, five or six months ago, and and since then it's it's been a you know it's 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 appreciated by more than a hundred percent. So quite a nice uh, quite a nice rebound for Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum is in the same boat, so we've seen nice moves in these. Uh, now we're back to you know seeing corrections because Bitcoin went all the way above above thirty k, and so uh, I told all of my uh, you know all of my marketplace uh, members I actually actually sold my Bitcoin and my Ethereum position uh, around the highs there uh, temporarily. I will I will rebuy. <laughs> mm. So uh, now we're seeing corrections in these, and we've seen about uh, I think about fifteen percent or so. Uh, corrections in Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin, and we could probably go a bit further. We could see 20, 25% corrections, and then th- these will be normal here. And I like Bitcoin. I like Ethereum long term. I think um, I think uh, that we probably saw bottoms in these also. Um, I, uh, you know, it's it's difficult to imagine uh, Bitcoin going back below 15k. Even though my uh, my bottom and tar- my my bottom uh, target was uh, was twelve thousand, mm-hmm. so we we almost we almost reached that we hit fourteen and a half thousand. I I don't think we're going to go lower than that. It's possible, mm-hmm. but I do think that was kind of like the bottom in the bear market, mm-hmm. and and I do believe that uh, it's possible to retest that level or an area around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we're going to get some buying interest at around 25k. Uh, if that falls through, I'll be a buyer at that, that 20k <laughs> of yeah. Bitcoin. Yes, absolutely. I, I do like it, and I think I think it's going to go much higher. Than mm-hmm. Would you subscribe then to the theory of Bitcoin being kind of the digital gold, kind of a that long term store of value? Yeah, you know, more of a risk asset kind of just play for you. Uh, you know, that's a vi- that's an excellent question. And, uh, uh, the way I'll, I'll answer it is I'll say it's something in between. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> because, because, uh, because, uh, it really, uh, to me, to me, it is, um, in a way it is, it is like, it is like digital. I mean, it is like, uh, like digital gold because, uh, you know, there's a finite amount of it. You, you can't have more than 21 million. You know, it's mineable for Christ's sakes. <laughs> no, of course, that's not the main issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they do mine it. But it is, it is, uh, uh, the most, uh, compelling thing about Bitcoin is that it is, uh, a store, a store of value in, in, in a way. It's, 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 de- it's decentralized. Uh, you don't need a parasitic third party, um, you know, controlling a transaction or a, uh, uh, taking a, a percentage of it, you know, so that's, uh, so, so, I mean, that's, that's the beautiful concept in Bitcoin. It's, uh, you know, it's not, con- it's not controlled by government. It's not printed. Mm-hmm. It's not minted by a central bank. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's, uh, it's inflation proof. I mean, it is. So, uh, obviously, uh, not obviously, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> You know the 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 fiat uh, money supply. It's uh, it's infinite. It's just you know the the Federal Reserve is is, is very good at demonstrating that because it it prints and prints and uh, you know spreads the uh, spreads the dollars all all around the globe. Uh, but I don't think uh, that this is a uh, that this is uh, right or or sustainable for for the long term. Mm-hmm. So and this this uh, you know this makes uh, Bitcoin so compelling. Uh, because, uh, you know, you can't just keep, uh, minting Bitcoins forever. You know, there's, uh, there is, uh, how many there are and then, and then that's it. If everyone in the world, uh, is going to want a Bitcoin, then, uh, Bitcoin is going to be worth, uh, a whole lot. And of course you can transact in them now in many places, even like, even big, com- big corporations like Microsoft accept, uh, Bitcoin for some, uh, services uh, or products. And, uh, you know, of course, we know about Tesla and uh, there are lots of corporations accepting 
uh, Bitcoin for products and services. So we see that this is a uh, this is not just a uh, you know a fluke. This is not just something like uh, temporary. Uh, many governments have officially uh, uh, declared Bitcoin uh, a, either a currency or or a, or a commodity, uh, but you know it is classified as something that um, I guess you could say tangible. So um, uh, yeah, and the reason I say is it's between uh, gold and uh, and and uh, something to to play around with. Is, uh, is because you know you you can't trade a, a physical gold like uh, like like you could Bitcoin. Of course, you can do e ETFs, uh, but it's it's not the same. And um, I don't think gold will ever will ever be as volatile as Bitcoin. Uh, even though gold, uh, in its own right, is, is 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 a bit volatile sometimes. But uh, you know, it's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be very volatile, and it's got all um, you know a lot of the the younger kids who want to be involved and. Uh, of course, they're influencing the market a lot, and and there's a lot of volatility because of that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's, so it's the future, so we 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 have to be we have to be on the right train, and okay. um, you know we we can't just say uh, I don't I don't think uh, you know I, I don't want to I don't want to be a critic of Warren Buffett, but I don't I don't think it's right when he, when he says uh, Bitcoin is nothing and it's worthless and it's garbage and blah blah blah. Because maybe he doesn't understand Bitcoin. Maybe he, maybe, uh, maybe I don't know why. But I don't, I don't, I don't agree with people that make comments like that. And I don't, I don't think it's right. Okay, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe in kind of a separate bag, something that obviously is institutionally kind of getting a bit more recognized. Countries recognizing it, companies buying it. Any thoughts on the altcoins? Is there any value there, or is that just a bunch of garbage? On the what? Uh, the altcoins. So your oh, other the, other cryptocurrencies. The, so the the, uh, the altcoins. No, no. Altcoins. Yeah. So uh, the altcoins. Uh, the altcoins. Uh, so that that whole market. It's like it's like the wild, 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 wild west. Uh, the reason why I say this is because there there uh, there is there are a lot of promising projects that are that are uh going to um uh make a change in the future so there are there are there are a lot of uh functional coins mm -hmm. uh that are um that that are worth uh you know obviously they're, they're worth a lot now and they're going to be worth a lot more later however at the same time there are a lot of uh, a lot of garbage that are eventually going to be you know that are eventually going to be worthless uh they are you know they're either they're either scams they're poor you know they, they have poor management they are poor projects they are um uh, they will be um you know pushed out of the market by by better projects by better coins um the that's why i say this that there's there's definitely a, a lot and a lot a lot of junk out there so i mean anyone investing should be very careful and should do a lot of research before investing mm -hmm. uh in, in in that market i mean the the big names like bitcoin and ethereum of course they're uh they're they're fine but you know like the like the little altcoins and you know uh there are some that could make you a fortune uh, but uh, most will probably just uh, uh, just uh, eventually go to zero, in my view. Mm -hmm. With that said, uh, is there any old coins that you have a position in that you would be comfortable disclosing? Or absolutely, just... absolutely, yeah. So um, I like several projects. Uh, one uh, one of the ones uh, I like uh, is Link. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's the actual. Uh, uh, uh that's the symbol link link chain it's called mm -hmm. uh yeah. also i like um also um i like some transactional coins because again i'm uh, uh there's a finite amount and if 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 the um um if the blockchain uh, works well and it's uh, and, and many of these work work very well um and you know if it's efficient and the 
there's actually there's uh there are excellent transactional coins like bitcoin cash mm -hmm. for instance you know uh it's not bitcoin but uh you know it you you can tr transact with it uh, quicker faster um cheaper so i mean that's that's one that i own uh also um uh there's a <clears throat> there's an altcoin out there called uh, called monero uh, xmr Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's uh, it's also mm -hmm. a transactional coin, and um, it's one for you know if you, if, you, if you, it's one that's uh, it's it's untraceable, mm -hmm. right? So uh, so that's that's the appeal there. Uh, I'm not saying that you know that some bad people they may use it in a bad way, but uh, that's you know that's not uh, that's uh, that's not why that's not why I own it. I own it because it's a uh, it's a good uh <clears throat> it has a secure blockchain and i see why i you know i i see that the appeal in uh in in using or owning this coin so i think it's going to go higher so yeah these are just a few of the ones that uh that I have positions and i don't i don't have positions in many right now anyways because you know the market is in an uncertain uncertain place and we may have further corrections in the in the alt space but there are, are definitely some some uh uh there are definitely some some very interesting projects out there that people should keep an eye on mm -hmm. yeah i think you you make some good points there with a lot of coins obviously maybe uh not having that much intrinsic value but still opening the door to a uh, very outsized gains i mean i think i don't know if you saw yeah. last week there was that a uh, huge rally in some coin called uh pepe coin which yeah. uh, appreciated about ten thousand percent and uh, minted a few millioners that there. So you know that is kind of the beauty of it. But like you say, I think it's uh, <laughs> obviously a, a space which is you have to know what you're doing, right? Or if you're yeah. if you're, if you're going to speculate some money, that's fine. If you're interested in the technology, that's also good. But you, yeah. know, you need to be aware of uh, what you're actually of trying course. to get here. I mean, or you get lucky because because for for this coin, this uh, for this for every one of these Pepe coins that appreciates, you know. By ten thousand percent, there's probably a hundred coins that are, you know, that are gonna, you know, be close to worthless in a, in maybe in a year or two. Right, and I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with gambling, you know. You can enjoy a bit of a fun gambling, but it's not investing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and 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 people people really need need to. Uh, I think I think people need to make that distinction that uh, there is investing, and then there's there's gambling, and then there's also something that we call trading. And we think it's in between, but really, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, but trading uh, is closer to ga to gambling mm. than, than investing. So um, yeah, I want to make that that distinction for sure. And if I, and and for those people who are going to be uh, trading uh, in the in the crypto markets, uh, please be very careful uh, because unless unless you're buying and holding Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, you're probably either trading or gambling in my view. Yeah, absolutely true. And with that, maybe just to touch up on this last subject before we uh, before we wrap up, since we're talking about trading and uh, how do you feel about technical analysis? Is that something that you use at all? Do you think it's just astrology for men? Um, no, absolutely not. I, uh, I'm, I'm I, uh, actually one of the... Uh, um one of the one of one of my i guess one of the one of the pillars of my investment style is based is based on, on technical analysis and in my marketplace uh each morning we we actually go through um uh, go through a technical analysis of of, of all the key markets like mm -hmm. uh, the nasdaq futures uh s&p futures gold silver oil uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and sometimes I do I do some other markets. But every day, we we go through the technicals on these, and uh, we do this because technicals are extremely important, especially especially if you want to beat the market. <laughs> because uh, in order to uh, in order to beat the market, uh, you have to, um, or at least I have to, um, at least trade a little bit around the peaks and troughs to to trim trim some profits you know uh when when a stock is, is overbought 
and of course, uh, you know, add or, or or initiative position or dollar cost average when a when a stock uh, is oversold is oversold. And there, of course, there are many patterns that we watch, like uh, you know, technical patterns, whatever you know, head and shoulders or you know, flags, uh, and and these patterns they. Um, um they're they're not just there for uh, for fun <laughs> they do they do it they do uh uh often indicate which way uh, a stock will go in the near term and um i want to i just i just want to quickly uh about fibonacci i know some people hmm. try to go you know they go like really old, like they go like um they get really into the technicals and maybe even uh, go overboard in my view like uh, because they start uh, going for everything like uh, at once, like Elliott Wave and Fibonacci, and then the the, um, the moving averages and all the technical indicators. That's too much. I don't. I respect uh, the Elliott Wave theory. I know there are some experts that uh, I respect the theory. I, uh, I I understand their Samaritan. I myself don't uh, don't use it much. Uh, um, I just, I just don't have, I just, I, I don't have much use for it because I do fine without it. Maybe that's what, uh, the Fibonacci, I have a problem with that because, uh, depending on the time frame you're looking at, it's going to be all different. So I'm not too big on the Fibonacci. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, but okay. I understand. Um, some people are into that. Um, no, uh, my technical analysis, basically, I just, uh, I use, I use several technical indicators like, uh, the RSI, the CCI, the full stochastic, the, um, uh, the 50 and the 200 day moving average mostly. Uh, of course I watch the volume and the technical patterns and, um, and basically I just combine that with, the uh, with the, the fundamentals and, the psychologicals, the psychological image that's that's going on um, at the moment. And basically, we try to combine all three of these together to get the best uh, possible picture of what's going on in, in markets and and how to beat the market is the is the result that uh, that we want to obtain. Yeah, that uh, makes makes a lot of sense. I do I do agree that um, you know sometimes. I mean, I do a lot of technical analysis as well myself, uh, but of course, a lot of people have that expectation that, you know, you could maybe use technical analysis to obviously uh, be able to predict any twist and turn in the market. And that's just, that's just not true. I think technical analysis has to be complemented with either fundamental analysis or just a larger understanding of, you know, other market dynamics, like the macro moves, or like I said, fundamentals. Absolutely, and I 100% agree with you. It should, it should all be combined together: the uh, fundamental analysis, the technical analysis, and even the the psychological factors that are going on in the markets are also very important. So, great points on that. Okay, uh, I'm just going to finish off with one last question then, because I've been uh, looking quite a lot lately at more international stocks, stuff outside mm -hmm. the U.S. Is that anything that uh, you're interested in? Do you ever buy many equities from outside the US and are there any geographies that you think uh, could be set to outperform moving forward yeah you know I do I do, uh, I do have some uh, some equities that are that are not US uh, based companies now some are just like um, um, I guess uh, gold and silver silver related so we're talking mostly about Canada and uh, and South America um you know south america for silver and some some gold for canada um aside from that but but these uh but these trade on major exchanges in the u.s mm -hmm. uh aside from that i uh i do i do have a place for for china in my portfolio and this and, and this this trade i mean this quarter it's i'll be honest the, this quarter it's killing me last quarter was great <laughs> with, with the chinese stocks uh, this quarter, they're kind of killing me a bit. Uh, yeah, they're they're performing poorly this quarter. And again, it's uh, um, sorry. Let's uh, first just uh, the Chinese stocks that 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 I like uh, that I like most are Baidu, uh, Alibaba, mm -hmm. uh, Pinduoduo, uh, JD.com, mm -hmm. and I also like uh, like Neo and uh, and and Xpeng. 
So these are the Chinese stocks that, that I like. I especially like uh, like Baidu because I mean I think it's super super cheap here and and, and Alibaba also of course. Mm-hmm. Um, now these stocks, uh, um, <clears throat> they're ADRs trade. So these are not the actual stocks. These are they're they're ADRs trade on on um, U.S. exchanges. Now these stocks they are they are just extremely cheap. Uh, uh, I mean, like trading, I think Alibaba was trading at something like around maybe eight or nine times earnings. So just uh, remarkably cheap. But of course, there's a reason for that because there's increased risk, geopolitical risks. There's, uh, you know, the Taiwan situation. Everyone is, is afraid of this turning into another Russia Ukraine situation, by the way. You know the the funny thing is is that I own some uh, some Russian stocks when uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. It's crazy. I had a uh, I had um I had Luke Oil and I had uh, Nornickel in my portfolio at that time. Did yep. uh, Luke Oil? But did that uh, plummet at one point? Or my? I- oh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. They, they they plummeted. I was so surprised. I was so sure that there was not going to be an invasion that I actually had two Russian stocks in my portfolio. Um, now, uh, I uh, <clears throat> fortunately I sold these as soon as I could because they closed trade on them. Then they, re- they reopened. They had a pop, and I actually so I sold I sold both those on the pop, and I was so happy to be out of those because right after that they dropped to like to like. To basically like uh, like nothing. Uh, so yeah, um, everyone is afraid of this this kind of situation happening with uh, with China and Taiwan. But I don't. I just I just don't think it's. Maybe I'm being naive, but I just I just don't see it happening. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen from a from a geopolitical standpoint. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert. I want to make that clear. But uh, I don't think that the uh, that the Chinese uh, president or the Chinese uh, Communist Party are uh, are are foolish. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I also uh, they have uh, I think they um, they have a very strong uh, political uh, they have they have they have a lot of political strength. I don't I don't think they need to use military force to. Um, uh, to get uh, what they want, I guess, uh, from from the Taiwan situation, I think it is enough. Uh, I think they have enough political um, political uh, abilities to reach uh, to reach a satisfactory um, result for for China, I guess you could mm-hmm. say. And also, let's not forget that there's no NATO there, and and it's a completely different situation. There's no like uh, you know. It's not a, it's it's not a Ukraine. So let's just uh, I just want to <clears throat> I just want to say that. But but that's the reason. That's one of the reasons why Chinese stocks are so cheap, is because uh, people are concerned about this. And mm-hmm. again, this uh, of course there's there's some increased risk here, but this uh, this serves up some some interesting opportunities if you are willing to uh, uh, to take the risk and uh, you know. And you want to own Baidu at ten times earnings? Uh, I do, because it's one of it's, it's one of the best internet companies in the world, and it's you know its market cap is like it should maybe be uh, five to ten times uh, worth worth more than it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll take my chance owning it because uh, you know worst 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 thing that can happen, you know the stock can go to zero, but uh, of course I don't think it will. Uh, but on, on, on the other, on the other side of the equation, it can appreciate considerably, you know, five, five to tenfold in, uh, in the next five years. Of course, if, uh, several factors line up, uh, as we want them to also, I want to emphasize that if you are, if you're concerned about, uh, Chinese ADRs, consider buying the stocks on the Hong Kong, uh, exchange. Mm-hmm. You can get access to the Hong Kong stock exchange on, um, uh, uh, I don't. I don't think all bro. Obviously, all brokers don't give you access, but uh, many do. Uh, I know. I know interactive brokers does. Okay, mm-hmm. so I mean, and I know many people use interactive brokers. So I mean, if you're if you're that concerned about, you know, the the U.S. the the China U.S. China tensions, 
don't buy the ADRs. Go directly to the Hong Kong uh, exchange and, and buy the Alibaba or the Baidu or the whatever shares there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once again, I find myself agreeing with most of what you say. I also do own some positions in some of those uh, Chinese companies. Baba, Neo is one that I've owned for some time as well. Um, I guess my question would be, as someone who is generally also optimistic that maybe, yeah, the Taiwan situation will... Uh, they're not going to invade Taiwan. But the question is, the fear is lingering. So what is the catalyst that actually pushes investors to say, okay, no, now I'm confident that, you know, that China isn't going to do anything stupid. And now we can, you know, resume buying these stocks and they can you know, go back to what you would think are more reasonable valuation points. Yeah, I mean, so we probably just, just need the, the Taiwan situation to a uh, to cool down a bit, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, get that story on, on on the back burner, and you know, get the attention away from it. And I think I think in time, um, that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, uh, there's 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 a lot of uh, attention on it now, and I was actually just looking in the, in the news today. There's some, you know, there's news every day about it, about and. Uh, People, people are reading this and they're, they're making investment decisions based on it. But, but, but based on what? Based on what, uh, what someone is writing in, uh, you know, in, what I, in, in, in a newspaper, based, based on someone's opinion, based on someone's speculation. You, you know, you're making, you're making investment decisions. Uh, uh, basically, I'm, I'm looking at the business. I'm looking at, at Alibaba, you know, as a business, you know, it's about to split up into, into six businesses and, you know, these six businesses should be worth a lot more mm. than the current market cap of 230 billion. That's how I look at it. I look at, at, uh, at Baidu. I see a market cap of something like, uh, of, uh, 40 billion. I see the company has, um, you know, like, uh, something like 35 billion in cash uh, versus like, uh, 20 billion in debt so i mean uh the enterprise value is down to like 30 billion on baidu i mean why because uh because there are all these stories around because there's all this speculation mm -hmm. so um i think once once uh once people start disregarding the noise uh, a little more you know, and start paying uh, more attention to the fundamentals of, of the business, you know, the business fundamentals, uh, perhaps uh, uh, then we're going to see more, uh, you know, more Western, more Western investors, uh, you know, put more money into, into these, uh, these um, Chinese businesses. And then we should see the stock prices, uh, you know, <clears throat> appreciate. Or, or at least at least normalize because they are very undervalued right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, I I tend to agree, and uh, let's let's hope that is the case. But you know, as there was that uh, who was it Buffett or no, one other famous investor who talked about said the market can stay rational longer than you can stay solvent or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yes, uh, the market can stay I irrational for longer Irrash than yeah. you or I can irrational for you. For longer than uh, than you or I can can stay solvent. Uh, who said that? I think it was uh, either Warren Buffett or, or maybe Benjamin Graham even said that. Hmm. Ben Graham or Warren Buffett? Yeah, one of those one of those uh, smart uh, smart investors uh, said that, and it's true. Uh, the market uh, it can stay rational, when it, and when we speak about Chinese stocks, that's uh, that's actually that's a great quote to use. I actually used that one myself the, <laughs> the other day when I was thinking about Chinese stocks. Yeah, the market can stay ir irrational uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something we should keep an eye on. Right, Victor. Well, I think we've covered a lot of bases. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to disclose your whole portfolio on this podcast. <laughs> if someone would was, was interested in looking at your portfolio, where can they find you? So they can, uh, can find me on Seeking Alpha. Uh, my marketplace, uh, the financial profit marketplace service. So just look up the financial profit on Sea Canal or Victor Durgano. All and right, then you, there you can get full access to the all weather portfolio, daily updates, and everything else that the service offers. All right. Well, there you have it. And like I said, it's been a great talking to you. Obviously, very knowledgeable 
once again, congratulations. You're doing very well in Seeking Alpha. And yeah, I hope we can do this again sometime soon. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the interview. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, very nice. And I hope that we, uh, that we speak again. I'll be, right, I'll great. be happy to, uh, to discuss some more topics with you. It was, it was, it was a fun interview. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Look forward to it. All right. Bye-bye everyone.